What is up and welcome to 24 Minutes of the Oscars, the podcast that takes a look at the 2024 Oscars 24 minutes at a time. I am Ethan Simi. And I'm Ben Lawhorn. This week on the pod, we are exploring the world around us and ourselves as we talk about Yorgos Lanthimos' Poor Things. The incredible tale about the fantastical evolution of Bella Baxter, a young woman brought back to life by the brilliant and unorthodox scientist, Dr. Godwin Baxter. This is best picture number four for us, Ben. Mm -hmm. Um, This is we we find ourselves in a little bit of a precarious um, pickle here. And um, before I say what that might be, I want to introduce our really exciting guest for for Poor Things um, to talk about this really wonderful movie with us, Annie Janes of the Movie Mavens podcast. Uh, Annie, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about Poor Things. Um, so a little bit behind the scenes, this is going to be our fourth best picture pod mm-hmm. out of 10 that we're doing for the Oscars season. But we are recording it about a week and a half before it's going to release. What that means is that by the time this episode comes out, the Oscars nomination lists, not only for Best Picture, but for every single category, will be out. We will have solidified nominations in which we can um, prognosticate our little minds out for figuring out who's going to win those actual lists. But right now... At a, t- a time of recording, and has been the case the last few episodes, we're just guessing. And so this is the last of our guessing pods, Ben, which I feel pretty good about. Yeah, I feel like we've done a decent job of what we've predicted so far, especially with the way the awards season has gone. So I feel I feel good about it. I'm excited to talk about this movie today. Yeah, it's going to be good. Uh, Annie, since the, um, since the lists are not out yet at time of recording... Are you making any other Oscar predictions? Are are you involved in this? Or are you just kind of like watching the Oscars for fun? Um, I mean, truly, truly, honestly, I have no skin in this game. Who am I? I'm nobody. But <laughs> you're Annie fucking hey, James. Yeah, you're <laughs> Annie. Come on. <laughs> um and I honestly I don't make predictions until really close to the Oscars and I don't really make predictions on who's going to be nominated, but once I have that list, then I go hard. And I will say I have won many a raffle with my predictions, but the key is I got to make them like the day before. Like I have to Mm. physically feel it out. All the, all the pre Oscar season. If I were to call it now, it'd be, it'd be totally wrong. Yeah, it's but hard to do it. <laughs> yeah. So now we go through all 12 Every categories. Every single yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough for sure. Uh I I think Ben, you beat me out last year on your correct predictions. Is that am I remembering that correctly? Yes, very much so. Yeah, I do remember Whoa. that specifically. Yeah. yeah, I think you only won by like one or two. I don't know if there's a very much so in there. All I remember is I only got two wrong, and both of them were, I believe, due to Babylon. So I blame <laughs> Fucking you. Fucking A. So. God damn it. <laughs> don't blame me, man. Blame the Academy. <laughs> That's brutal stuff. That's brutal. Um, yeah, so this episode, um, even though it doesn't make sense in real time, we'll still be guessing who is going to be nominated for Best Picture. We're going to be guessing um, who is going to be nominated for Best Cinematography. We're going to be talking about that in relation to Poor Things. Um, And of course, having ourselves a little Emma Stone conversation as well, uh, because at time of recording, Critics' Choice just happened uh, last night. And little surprise, little interesting, Poor Things, getting a little little extra juice. Uh, Annie, you mentioned you don't... um, you don't guess, you don't predict Oscars really until like the day before, but what is your history with the Oscars? Have you been watching it for a long time? Um, do you have a history with it or do you more so just, just come for the enjoyment? Um, I do have a history with it. I think I started watching the Oscars. My first like big memory of it was um, the Catherine Bigelow, James Cameron, mm. Avatar, and... Uh, Hurt Locker year. Yeah. Um, which means I was a teenager. So I've been watching it since then, which feels like a long time, but I think the last two years I skipped out on it. I didn't watch it live. And I don't know why. I think there was like one year where it was really a 
quite a dud. And then I just felt like, okay, that's it. No more. I don't, I don't need to watch this live anymore. I can get those like four or five hours back. Um, fair, but I think it's also like my inner relationship with award shows has also been shifting over time. Like when I was in high school, I was like, probably close to tears if someone wins just because I'm like, Oh, I feel so proud of mm-hmm. that. And like, I can't mm-hmm. imagine what that would feel like. And then now it's just like, it feels like when the, when, when you know that reality shows aren't real anymore, it feels like, Oh, well there's actually what? like money and campaigning <laughs> <laughs> involved. Yeah. Sure. Um, one, one moment, please. Sorry. Can we, can we talk about that very briefly about the money and the campaigning? Just because mm. at a time of recording this, so Paul Giamatti did win for Best Actor last night at the Critics' Choice. And I'm sure that we're going to talk about this on other episodes of the podcast as well. But the reason I bring that up is because he did go kind of viral over the last week for going to In-N-Out after winning his Golden Globe, uh, actually, and, um, and, and enjoying two burgers, no fries. And he's been questioned about this a lot. And You're saying he, it's a conspiracy. I, look, the conspiracy it's, runs deep. It, in and out is nothing new to like the the marketing game when it comes to award season. It's been a pretty clutch player uh, for for a while now, but. I bring this up because you're definitely right, Annie, and the fact that some people get it and some people want to be part of that game and other people don't, which is always a very fascinating juxtaposition of like seeing what might happen to Paul Giamatti. Uh, and he's asked and he's like, I just went there because I like good burgers. Mm-hmm. Do you, I, I want to ask, do, do, do you think he went there just because he likes good burgers or is, it was his PR person like, you got to go. You're going to sit down at the table. You're going to put the Golden Globe on the outside of the table. Someone's going to snap a picture. It's going to go viral. And this will boost your campaign leading to the Academy Awards. Okay. I actually hadn't considered this at all. Like when I was talking about money and campaigning, like I just met it <laughs> not attached to this moment. But now that you're tying the just two together. Uh, I mean, I want to believe it's authentic. I do. Yeah. Paul Giamatti. I don't I, think it is. I don't think it is. It feels like whoa. Kristen Bell and the burrito. You guys remember this? No. What is this? There was just like a, a year where she showed up to an award show with like a burrito in her purse, oh. but it wasn't just that moment. It was like, it was like pictures she's posting on her Instagram mm-hmm. in the dressing room with the burrito and oh, oh. things like that. This is a very vague memory. I could be, I could be a little off about this, but um, it feels calculated. Who knows? Yeah, it's hard. No, I mean, it, it reminded me of what Patton did, you know, forever ago. What he's at, was he outside like Arby's or something like that after he won his <laughs> mm-hmm. award? It felt similar to that. I don't know. It's a bummer to think if it's calculated that way, but it is also yeah. hard not to think of it as being calculated, just knowing what the PR machine is like for all these actors. So, in that case, I have to ask because we're talking about this topic and this is our podcast and we're talking about the Oscars because I have to, I have to talk to somebody about this. I have to talk to my people here. Um, I'm going to bring it back to Bradley Cooper because this is a very interesting, (laughs) interesting thing for me. I cannot rein it in when it comes to Bradley Cooper. He, he wants the Oscar, right? He's trying very hard. He's making the rounds. He, he's, he's interviewing. He's telling people how badly he wants this. Why? Does his team not just basically tell him, like, look, take it easy, cool off. All you got to do, go to in and out afterwards. You don't even have to win an award. Just go with somebody who won an award and be a man of the people and play it on the more low-key side. Why can't we not... You know what he, I mean? He doesn't feel like a listen to his team kind of guy. <laughs> he, you know, to be me, he doesn't like, strike me as a man of the people. <laughs> yeah. Like he's not cool enough to pull that off. Yeah. Where is he going? If Bradley Cooper is going to pull this off, where is he going? What restaurant? Because not in and out. That's way too much of the people. <laughs> it's somewhere I mean, in like the Grove where it's still yeah. like fancy. and He's going I to a steakhouse know. probably. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. If it's I had my way, Chili's. he'd go to like Sizzler or something like that, but he's not going to pull that off. Yeah, go to Chili's. Go to a Margaritaville. That could be good. That's like a nice, a good mix. See yeah. that guy enjoying a margarita at Margaritaville? <laughs> Just, I think we need to become Bradley Cooper's PR team for this Oscar. 
just tease us with Hangover Four. It's all we need. Be like, if you guys will give <laughs> no, me this, stop. I'll stop doing serious stuff. <laughs> no. Okay, I, I, I got you, Bradley. I, I got a poll in from my Bradley Cooper getting just be handsome here. and funny. It's all we want. <laughs> it's all we want from you, please. No, please. Uh, okay, so lots of things do go into the Academy Awards, obviously, and and uh, the lead into it. Um, We've got about six or seven weeks to go until um, they the award show happens, the biggest night in Hollywood. Let's break down poor things before we talk about the film. Let's talk about what we think it's going to be nominated for. Of course, again, we will know what it is nominated for by the time this podcast comes out, but we don't know right now. And so we're playing this little little game. Um, and once people can listen to this show, then we can actually figure out how many we got right and uh, and, and guess what it will have been nominated for. Um, of course, Best Picture. That's why we're covering this here on the show. Best Director, Yorgos Lanthimos. Best Actress, Emma Stone. Best Actor in a Supporting Role, Willem Dafoe and or Mark Ruffalo. I don't know. Let's put a pin in that. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, adapted Screenplay, Production Design, Cinematography, Costume Design, Film Editing, Makeup and Hairstyling, Visual Effects. Uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven are on that list right now. Annie. Do you think it gets nominated for all 11 of those categories? The only one I'm unsure on, I feel like I saw it left out of best director in some mm-hmm. of these lists. Mm-hmm. Which, I think that's the most on the bubble right now. Um, and then in terms of best supporting, it could be both. It could be one or the other. That one's really hard to call. But honestly, I think it gets nominated for all of these. Whether mm-hmm. it wins, we'll have to see about that. Yeah. <laughs> What it feels do you like, think, though? <laughs> it feels like something's going to get a lot of nominations, but not a lot of wins. Um, I'm curious about makeup and hairstyling, but I think that's maybe because I'm so sour about Priscilla, you know? And yeah. I'm just like, I feel like that had more than this movie does. And this movie, I don't know. I mean, still great hairstyling stuff, but probably more costume design and production design. I'm I- very curious if both the supporting roles will get nominated because that's not far-fetched for a Yorgos film because we got that with the favorite where Emma Stone and sure. Rachel Weiss were both nominated for supporting and then Olivia Coleman for lead for lead so it'd be kind of and interesting Olivia if Coleman won again. that year didn't she yeah yeah interesting so it'd be kind of interesting to see if that happens again because I think both Defoe and Ruffalo are you know worthy of being nominated but obviously there's it's a big field for sure yeah I'm I wonder if it'll get nominated for all 11 of these. I think the big ones that I could see it missing out on, um, I think really like best director is the the most on the bubble for me right now. I feel like production design, costume design, like visual effects, I feel like those are kind of locks for this, for this movie. Um, so seeing it have the potential to have double digit nominations is big. Um, the Willem Dafoe, Mark Ruffalo thing is interesting because it always brings up this conversation of um, do does that split the vote, right? And we saw this happen last year with Everything Everywhere All at Once um, where we get um, Stephanie Sue and Jamie Lee Curtis both as a supporting actress and actually don't split the votes. We we give it to Jamie Lee Curtis. I want to, I'm, I'm curious if both get nominated could that be beneficial for poor things as a whole? Or like you said, Ben, does that maybe add to the, you know what, let's just nominate it a lot and we'll just goose egg it like the Irishman. I kind of lean towards that. I think it's just going to get a lot of nominations and not a lot of like, that's the recognition it's going to get. It's not going to get a lot of winning recognition. Um, Emma Stone, I think has, probably the best chance out of this list but even then coming up against lily gladstone it's gonna be it's tough you know it's really hard to do but um yeah i don't know it's just i think the recognition is going to be in the nominations i feel like if this were a different year maybe the past few years when there was sort of a lull in movies coming out this movie could have easily been like the one that's winning the most oscars Mm. it just feels Mm -hmm. like a really stacked year in terms of like a war darling kind of movies. It does. And I think that's a very interesting segue into the Emma Stone situation. Now I know we talked about best actress when we talked about Barbie a couple of weeks ago, 
but I kind of want to hearken that conversation back a little bit because at least for me, and I feel like most of the predictions that are floating out there right now does see uh, Lily Gladstone taking Best Actress at the Academy Awards. But Emma Stone won at the Critics' Choice Awards for Best Actress, and I think that was quite an unexpected win for her. Does that win have the power and have the juice to drive Emma Stone to a Best Actress win and 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 maybe help pour things out as a whole kind of really gain that momentum because poor things I think at time of recording is still not like crazy nationwide it's still like a little bit of a limited release so it feels like that could be the the quote-unquote like beginning of the late stage surge for a poor things takeover yeah I mean I agree I think if it goes why that could help it out for sure but i I think something else to keep in mind is I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of crossover between the critics choice award and the Oscars as far as like the Mm. voting body. That's Um, what I was wondering too. And again, back to, this is me thinking about the money. Like, can I do like money? Yeah. Are they like uh, campaigning for an Oscar and they're just like, well, we don't really care about the critics awards. It seems like a lower, yeah, a lower tier award show. So like, I wonder if that has anything to do with it too. Yeah, I mean, super possible, but I do think it's down to her and Lily, and I think we saw that in the mm-hmm. Golden Globes because they both won for their respective categories. Um, it's an interesting debate, I think, and maybe one that we can get into because I think Emma Stone is given a lot more to do in this movie than Lily is in Killers of the Flower Moon, mm. um, but that performance from Lily Gladstone is just amazing. It's a fantastic performance, so... I'm curious to see, but it feels like it's down to the two of them for sure. To that extreme, is a good point. Yeah. That, just that uh, Emma Stone like is in every moment of poor things and she's mm-hmm. carrying, carrying the whole film on this like character versus Lily Gladstone yeah. is playing a very specific role for most of the film. Yeah. The Oscars also historically like to re-award people. Um, Emma Stone, this could be, could be her second win here um, that we see where as like conversely for Lily Gladstone, this has the narrative behind it of this might be her chance. Like we don't know if she'll ever get to this position again, or if she'll ever find herself in this kind of a movie or situation or, or field of nominees again, where she could win. So I think that's a a really interesting narrative for the best actress race, which I think is shaping up to be one of the more interesting races. And even if it is a little bit more like locked down towards Lily Gladstone, I think there's some really fascinating narratives with both of them. Yorgos Lanthimos did get nominated at the uh, DGA nominations for Directors Guild. He was one of the five. Um, And then at the Golden Globes, Poor Things got seven nominations, one win, And I think that does speak a little bit to your idea of like, maybe it's all nominations and no wins because the only category it won was for best motion picture, musical or comedy. And let's be honest, the only reason it won that is because there is a drama category and a musical or comedy category. If there's one, I don't think it wins it. And that's a lot of nominations to only walk away with one win. Well, I mean, it did win two. The other thing that it won was for best performance from a female actor in a musical or comedy. So Right. Okay. One best, but yeah, it's the same the split, same again. principle between the two. Where it's just like, yeah, one it because it's a separate thing, but now if it's going up against, you know, the Oppenheimer slash Killers of Fire Moon of it all, like that's that's a tough hill to climb. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's tough. I think that's why Golden Globes are also so fun because we get two winners. You know, it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> this is cool. We can kind of then pit these yeah. two against each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yorgos gets nominated for DGA. We still think he's on the bubble for directors of the five for the Academy Awards. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious I'm, how many directors are in the voting body. You know what I mean? Cause I'm, I was looking it up with golden globes. That's like 150 people are voting on that. Like it's not a huge okay. group and the Academy is something like 7,800 people. Yeah. So it's curious to hear you mm. know, how many of those people say like, well, what do the directors guild, what directors did they choose? Like, do they respect that voting body for that category more? Or are they just kind of going with their heart? Because I think that happens a lot, you know, it's just like, okay, so what, like 
the editors, what did they recognize? Because maybe I should recognize that too. And if that's the case, then maybe Yorgos makes it in. I mean, he's he'd be worthy of it, in my opinion. What do you think, Danny? He would be worthy of it, and that that thought is hard to separate from like what you think is going to happen versus what you want to happen. Mm-hmm. And I want him to get this nom because I think he is worthy of it. Um, I'm going to say that he does get it. He gets in. But okay. does him getting it mean that something else major wouldn't get it? Is there that I mean, many noms? I, I think right now we've got Christopher Nolan, Martin Scorsese, Alexander Payne for the holdovers, Jonathan Glazer for the zone of interest and Greta Gerwig for Barbie. Those are like, those are the five that variety is p- predicting right now with your ghost being on the six bubble. I think out of that, I think that personally P- Payne misses out for the holdovers. If if that's the case, I just feel you've got to have Greta. We know Christopher Nolan and Martin Scorsese are a lock. And I cannot help but think that everybody voting and, and being nominated will understand the importance of Jonathan Glazer. And like this is the movie to nominate him for. But I could be totally wrong because we're talking about this right now in the past. Yeah. So this will already be sorted when this pod comes out. Yeah. I think it might be Jonathan Glazer that gets the boot and your ghost no, gets the nom. No, don't speak that into existence, Annie. That I mean, you it. talk about them liking to repeat noms. I mean, Yorgos has been nominated three times already, only once for directing. But, you mm-hmm. know, it's it's kind of the same theory as the Emma Stone theory. It's like, well, we've done it once. Like, let's bring him back. Like, yeah. So and that's the same with Alexander Payne. They really like him a lot as well. But they I could see I see your argument with Alexander Payne because I could see them rewarding him with the writing, you know, as opposed to the directing, directing. which Yorgos isn't up for with um, poor things. Yeah, which is, you know, uh, some interesting narratives around that as well. Like come this Oscar season about like, um, you know, um, American fiction might be this kind of underdog. Uh, if, if it gets nominated for Best Picture, it might like pull a spotlight and just just win Best Pick and, and totally. go go out on, on everything else. So I think there's a lot of interesting narratives. Like the closer we get to the Academy Awards, what do you guys think Poor Things is going to walk away with um, at the end of the night? of the Academy Awards. Do you think it will win any trophy? This is, this is the moment to put it out into the world. I'll start. I think it's going to get costume design. Mm-hmm. Production design. Mm. And best actress. Nice. As of wow. now. Going with best actress. As of now I am. Yeah. Okay. Like ben, what, what do you got for the dubs? I think I might say nothing, um, mm-hmm. but my top two would be costume and production, but my other top two out of that is Barbie, and that's a hard thing to go up against as well for both costume and production design. Like, they both, both of these movies have great costumes and great production design, so it'll be, it'll be hard, and I feel like I don't know what they're going to give Barbie really and so that might be kind of where it goes but that we're falling into that with a lot of these things here because it kind of feels like director and picture are maybe not locked up but kind of you know assumed what's going to happen there so if mm-hmm. it's anything i think it's costume or production design i i think it gets nominated for probably 9 to 11 i don't want to put a like a definite number because i'm a coward and i don't know what it'll end up i don't want to be wrong on what it's going to be nominated for i think it walks home with costume design and i think the academy splits the vote i think it goes poor things for costume design barbie for production design and i think the only other toss up that i could see it like truly competing for would be makeup and hairstyling but it just feels to me that it's it's either Maestro or Oppenheimer in in that category. Um, we'll we'll see how much you know steam Oppenheimer gains below the line as well. Um, that's a whole narrative in and of itself. So I think it walks home with one out of a potential double digits. Poor things might have the biggest uphill battle of any movie right now going into the Academy Awards because it is so like talked about and hyped around and like the Emma Stone of everything. But it's also, it's, it's finds itself in this really weird middle ground of like not being American fiction potentially where it's like, mm-hmm. uh Oh, look out. This movie might come out of nowhere and it's not Oppenheimer and it's, and it's 
not Killers of the Flower Moon. <laughs> so it's 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 in this weird like the Academy three- loves to do that. It's like here's a pile of really like a handful of really um, potential Best Picture nominees, and then the Academy's like, but look over there. Yeah, <laughs> like this exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I think Poor Things finds itself in a really interesting predicament. Um, Ethan, well, before we move on, yeah, how sad are you going to be if we don't get to do a Maestro episode? I'm going to be so fucking heartbroken, Ben. I, I feel can't like, even tell you. I feel like you've talked a, about the movie enough in every other episode that we don't every need episode. to do an episode <laughs> on Maestro. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel like, yeah, you're going to be heartbroken. I will be very, very heartbroken. And I guess the next episode um, of this pod that comes out after this, we'll maybe have a deeper conversation because we'll know then um, if Maestro will be nominated for Best Picture or any other categories. Um, Look, there's still hope for Best Director. Who knows? For Bradley Cooper. can't be as sad as Bradley will be if (laughs) he doesn't go. (laughs) You got to let him be the John Magaro of the Oscars. Let him be a sad boy. Yeah. Let him fulfill that sad boy spot. (laughs) Um, We will definitely be having a... um, a reaction episode on January 23rd. So our, our podcast will have that. Um, when this comes out, that'll already happen. So everybody already knows that that happened. Um, okay. Are you guys ready to talk about poor things? Break it down a little bit. Talk about the film. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Ben, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to throw to you a little bit, man, because you just saw this movie about an hour or two ago. Amy mm-hmm. saw it a couple of weeks ago. I saw it about a month ago, so I, I I've got the um the biggest gap here between my viewing and my speaking, and you're fresh, man. I am fresh. That's a lot of pressure. Am I taking over to cinema here? Is this Do a, it, man. A pod first. It. Yeah, pod oh, first. God Why damn. not? Do you want to go over general thoughts on the movie, or do you just yeah. want to dive right into let's, true cinema? Let's do general thoughts. Let's Annie. Let's start with you. I'm curious what you think about poor things as a whole. Um, as a whole, I really, really liked this movie, but I don't think I loved it. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, I liked some of Yorgos's others more while I was watching it. I was like, I don't know how much I like this. Um, but by the time it was over, I was like, yeah, that was really, really, really good. We can dive into more of those criticisms I have later and, but mostly praises. Nice. All right. I liked it. Um, yeah. I feel similarly, to be honest. I think I really, really liked it, but I don't think I, like, fell in love with it. Um, I think the more that I think about this, and, like, I wanted to go see it a second time. Unfortunately, snow hit Portland, and, and when it snows in Portland, the whole city acts as if it's at the end of times. So everything shuts down. You can't go anywhere. So I wasn't able to see it a second time. Uh, and I know it was, like, outside of my top 10 of 2023, I don't think it was as close to that list as I thought it was going to be much funnier than I anticipated quite hysterical film uh and it and a really fun movie to watch and like be transported to this type of a world like this type of thing that exists that is just not real that is being like totally owned by uh Emma Stone and Mark Ruffalo and and the amazing cast and and Yorgos having these really interesting and uh, fascinating directing styles with the frames that he does. But the one thing that I've been thinking about is how rewatchable is this movie? Because for me, the last 20 minutes or the last 25 minutes of the movie where Christopher Abbott shows up and we Mm -hmm. kind of get this like really sidebar story of what's going on, that was all shock value. Now I know going in to this film, again, what, what's to be expected and what might, or what is going to happen. And I wonder if it loses some of that like rewatchability value. Uh, but I, I, I really did enjoy it. That's interesting. Cause I, I'm curious, like, as you said that, it's just like how much of Yorgos's filmography is, a is rewatchable, rewatchable. You know what I mean? <laughs> Cause it is kind of just like, you know, what? I don't yeah. throw on dog tooth real quick, you know, or just like, yeah. <laughs> killing the sacred let me beer. toss on the lobster, please. Yeah, yeah. I got two hours to kill. What am I going to do? Um, That's fair. But I mean, I I totally hear what both of you guys are saying. I left the theater with a new favorite from Yorgos. Um, Whoa! I really had a great time with this movie. Uh, It does make me wonder, though. You know, you guys are a bit removed from it, so like, will my you know love for it kind of dwindle over time? I'm not sure. But as of right now, I thought it was great. I thought it was his funniest movie. Um, I loved, as we've been talking about, the production design. The cinematography I thought was fantastic. Like it's, it's my 
it, this is his first since the favorite, but that was, you know, that was my favorite stuff that he had shot. And we got a lot more of that kind of style here with the fisheye lens and all that stuff, which I thought was used really, really well. Mm-hmm. Um, the performances were great. Just seeing the progression of Emma Stone's character throughout the movie was so interesting to me. Um, I thought she was just, yeah, just wonderful in here. And then same with everybody else. Ruffalo was just like, so weird in the best way you know that he gets allowed to be weird um and defoe you're not i don't know it's weird to like have a character where you're very aware of his facial prosthetics but you're just like no it's cool i get it like that's that guy you know it's like that makes sense for sure i just Um, think it's funny that they like all they had to do was slap like one prosthetic on defoe and they're like he's a monster yeah Yeah. exactly (laughs) yeah he's basically frankenstein's monster now um what did yeah, you guys? Know. What did you guys think of his bubble, his burping bubble bit? <laughs> I, I mean, again, like that's kind of some of the stuff I love because like it's never really explained. You know, it's yeah. just like we're just gonna have some of this surreal. There's these very few surreal things, like all the animals that are like half of the other animal. You know, it's just and we kind of just live with that in the world. But I, I was able to just accept it. I'm like, yeah, I guess that makes sense, you know? And Mm -hmm. even the same of all the different cities where it's like, yeah, I guess this is like this world's Lisbon. They have like a floating trolley system, you know, like that kind of (laughs) thing. It's like, cool. All right, great. You know, like that's, that's awesome. So I, yeah, I don't know. I just, I bought into it burps and all, you know? Yeah. I love the burps. I love that they were introduced like with no like context or fanfare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then like later on in the middle of the movie, I think he's explaining to his, like, uh, his ward slash Bella Baxter's first yeah. fiance that, um, it is, is another example of how his father was like abusive towards him in the name of science. Mm-hmm. Um, which was like an interesting through line for his character, yeah. but it was also a fun piece of set deck. It felt like very whimsical to me and mm-hmm. it I don't know. It added up to all that other stuff you were talking about too. I quite liked it. I wonder if this is the, the most fantastical slash like joyous Lanthimos movie that exists. Yeah. I would think so for sure. Yeah. I think yeah, I think is. so. And that was why I thought I would love it. Like I thought this mm-hmm. was going to be maybe like not only a favorite film of the year, but I thought maybe it could be, you know, one of my favorites of all of all time mm-hmm. because of like I really like Lanthimos, but seeing the whimsical world that poor things had ahead of seeing the movie, I thought that it was going to be like amazing to me and it didn't quite hit that, but it's still, I still really liked it. I just, it wasn't that for me. Yeah. As we go through this movie, I think um, the one thing for me that I kept thinking back to uh, was this movie from 1967, this French film called Belle de Jour. It's, obviously he- heavily uh in like an, an homage to this film which is very much of a of a similar idea not necessarily the frankenstein aspect of of bella baxter but this uh woman's liberation through sexual independence and uh what that means to her and what that means to her world i recommend anybody check that movie out if if you liked poor things or if you liked those uh sections and those moments of poor things and that theme and idea uh belle de jour is definitely worth watching and i think that to me is a very, very excellent film. And this felt similar to that, just completely different in like its set design and, and it's uh, kind of monstrosity effects that it, that it does. Uh, let's do the first true cinema, Ben uh, meeting, meeting Bella. Yeah. I mean, we start out here, the film starts with this push in on this woman who's standing on a bridge and mm-hmm. we see her kind of like jump off. We have no idea who it is or any of the context behind it. That's just kind of it. And then we cut to meeting Bella in the present day and she's very infant like, you know, a lot of screaming, like not, not able to say bye, but like, uh, you know, like just these, we're seeing these things that just remind you of a child, basically um, smashing the plates, just all this kind of activity. I thought it was just a great way to set the stage of like, this is where we're at with this character right now. Um, everyone around her is just accepting of this. So it's like, okay, this is, normal at least in this world so we can buy into it um but the stumbling with the walking and all that kind of stuff i just thought it was a real great way to set up a character for us to get to know yeah do you think uh do you think emma stone walked around her house like that to prep for this role 
Oh, for sure. I mean, <laughs> I, I, yeah, without a doubt, I think that'd be pretty fun preparation for a role. Just like, I thought that, honestly, I thought that's what was so interesting here because there's a way to do it that I think is bad. It's almost like when you see a bad drunk scene, you know, when someone's yeah, like trying to sure. play drunk and it's like, you're not drunk. And I don't know if you've ever been drunk because this looks <laughs> really bad, you know? Um, but watching her do this, I was like, oh, that's like, it's believable. Like, what would an infant look like? in a you know woman who's in her late 20s early 30s what would that look like it's like that's probably what it would look like it was very believable to me yeah it's a really comical introduction to this world and this character as well uh because we we obviously get to see all like the physical manifestations but we also get to see defoe as dr godwin baxter and what he means and like what his like what he means in her life and what his job really like is like he this is like what he does he's just mm-hmm. a, a mad scientist uh Annie what did you think about this opening I really liked it and I liked the suspense of not knowing exactly like what or how she was yeah um and maybe having an assumption but then um the scene where you finally get to know what happened to her as told by Willem Dafoe's character was like one of my favorites of the whole movie. I thought it was so, that was one of the funniest moments for me. Yeah. The part where he says like, so obviously I <laughs> like, and then yeah. he goes on to explain what he did. Um, and I just love the confidence of the film to just to be like, this is the world and this is what's yeah. happened and it's going to get weirder for, from here. So like strap in. Um, so I really, I really love the way it starts. The yeah, opening couple chapters were some of my favorites of the film. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It and it's fun because like- I feel like, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ethan. No, go ahead, Ben. Well, I'll just say, I feel like Rami Youssef was kind of our, um, like the audience's way through this movie because just like you said, Annie, the whole like, and obviously I had to cut the baby out. He's like, obviously, like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know? So there is this like part of the world that probably would think some of this stuff is strange but it's great that the world we're put into, which is Defoe's world, which is, you know, Bella Baxter's world. It's just accepted that you, yeah, you have a half dog, half chicken. Like that's just a thing. That's fine. Um, But some people from the outside might see that as strange, but yeah, I think that that's a great call. Yeah. It feels like Yorgos is kind of walking on this um, like razor's edge of this comedy that he's so very, very good at. And I don't, I don't think if it, if it wasn't Yorgos making this movie, there's no way this movie works. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think obviously we have the pieces in Mark Ruffalo and Emma Stone and everybody like fully committing, but it's that type of comedy that we get from Defoe, from these monologues, from like the very matter of fact, dark comedy of this, this is the world. And so obviously I took out the baby and put her brain in and yeah. Bella, like, why wouldn't I do that? And that is that full buy-in that we end up getting that makes the movie work. So much like you, Annie, I think the the first couple of chapters of the film were my favorite because it has not necessarily that shock value, but like that full immersion into like, oh, I'm discovering much like Bella is as we go through the movie, like I'm discovering this world and like who these people are and what it means to be a person with these surroundings. Uh, and, and I think that does really, really work. Um, of course, Ben, you mentioned like Rami Youssef's character is kind of our um, Max McCandles is like our um, person that we we kind of uh, operate through and trying to understand all of this uh, until until we meet Mark Ruffalo, who I think is is quite sublime in this film. He's nuts. He's, he's nuts. <laughs> he's so it's funny. so good. <laughs> like he is awesome in this. Um, his character is so interesting. I mean, just the first meeting that he has with Defoe is, I mean, that's interesting, but Mm -hmm. to immediately go and like, I've got to see who this woman is that, you know, is so important that you have to keep her caged in. Um, And then, I mean, that was one of the, I loved, there's so many phrases that Bella says throughout the movie that I thought was hilarious. And this was even just one of them's like, Oh, hello, visiting man. You know, (laughs) she's just like, yeah, I guess that's what you would call him if you had the brain of a two or three year old or whatever, you know, it's like, Oh yeah, this is the visiting man. Um, but like the moves that he makes in that scene and then coming back and talking to like it, he, we just know right away, like this dude is up to something and he is fucking weird. But what's we're here crazy for about his character is like how, when he says that, when he's like, I must know who this woman is that like you have to keep hidden. 
Um, we don't know it at the time, but I feel like his motives are just like actually pretty, pretty bad. He's like, yeah, you I mean, have just a woman under your full control. I want one of those. Yeah. Let me go yeah. meet her. Yeah. And like, exactly. he's obsessed from her before he even meets her. Like, and so when we see his downfall later through obsession, like to see how far he falls, I think it's really funny and accurate, like to the character that they introduce thinking back on it now. Yeah, and and to that point, all of our characters are different kind of points on this on this very wide line of like where they fall in their not only their relationships with Bella, but like their relationships with with people and and how they treat those around them. Obviously, we get Ruffalo's character who is of that mindset, and then you get Max who is kind of somewhere in the middle. Like he he wants to know more and wants to study her um, for his own knowledge, like benefit. And then we get Bella, who's discovering herself. But then we also get um, Godwin, who acts as this conduit of like a very, very much so a godlike character in Bella's life, in the world that's around, uh, and and what his viewpoint of the world is. So I think it's cool that we get someone different at different points, and they all offer something for the relationships between all these characters. Uh, who who is your favorite character in the movie? Mm. I'm curious because I, I I think the more that I think about it, I really like um, Max, and I I think he's a really interesting part of the film. Yeah, um, I think my favorite character is Bella, but when it comes to Max, when I first saw the film, I was like, what mm-hmm. what are they trying to say exactly with Max? <laughs> um, and my conclusion was that like just very simply the man that's pure of heart gets the girl. Like if you're (laughs) like going to boil it down to it's like most simple terms, that's sort of what I think it was trying to say. Like he respected Bella's like body as her own and her choices and didn't like judge her for them. Um, and also was like truly in love with her and that when she returns, he's like, admits that he was in love with a different version of her, but he still loves her like this new Bella too. And that was just like him showing the ultimate respect in my mind. I think that's what the movie was saying with him, but I'm curious what y'all took away from it. Yeah. I think that totally tracks. I think this also so much of this movie was someone living their life in a very fast, like, um, sped Life in up the fast way. lane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where it's just like she she met the you know there's the trope in movies of like the guy you take home to meet your parents and the guy you have fun with like that kind of a thing. And she like yeah I'm gonna I'll marry you Max that's great but first I'm gonna go on the sexual <laughs> escapade with this dude but I'll be back to marry you you know what I mean and then like you get to benefit from this too and it's like ah, I guess you know to some extent that's just that's kind of what happens, you know, in people's lives sometimes, but it's just not as point blank as this, you know, and this happens in such a fast pace. Um, I I did think that was so interesting, just all the relation to people's lives that take span over 20 years or something like that. And then she's getting it in just like months, you know, or weeks or whatever. Um, But yeah, I thought that was, so for me, he just felt like the safety net or whatever you can come back home to, I guess. I really like him at the end, especially the conversation that he has with Bella about like she's come back and she's different and he was expecting a certain kind of person or relationship and that is not how things are going to go now. And she needs to live the life that she needs to live essentially. So like she needs to continue to have that power over herself uh, and his acceptance of that. I think he's a really good identifier of the fact that like, People change and obviously like sexual independence is a very big springboard to that for somebody. Mm -hmm. Uh, But regardless of what that might be, that idea of a person that he is constantly studying, he's constantly taking notes about, he's constantly writing about how much she eats and when she goes to bed and when she goes to bed and like all of these types of data points, that doesn't... um, constitute like what a person is and i think that he has a he his storyline is really interesting in that aspect of like he is kind of just along for the ride and he sees all the evolution change and that might spark evolution in himself to be like okay yeah cool i guess you know people do change and like you're not the same person that 
I initially talked with Godwin about about marrying, uh, mm. which which I think is interesting. And um, funnily enough, like while Bella's on her own, like missions, having her <laughs> <laughs> fun times with all all the men she's with. I think it's really hilarious that Max is like, meanwhile, making another like monster yeah. woman <laughs> yeah. th- that needs like teaching. And also you can like uh, keep track of. I think that was pretty funny. Shout out to Margaret Qualley and Christopher Abbott for being in this movie. They were in Stars at Noon together. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I think they were quite great in Stars at Noon, which has grown on me the more that I think about it. I think it was a okay. little harsh on this pod. Um, but yeah, I, I liked them being in, the, in this movie together. And I thought Margaret Qualley as like the new Bella Baxter was was really good as well. Yeah, she did a great job. She was awesome. Uh, so yeah, she says she'll go, go away with Ruffalo and the first title card we get is in Lisbon and this is where they end up and we get to... We get some funny scenes here. We get a great dinner scene with some uh, fellatio jokes that don't go over well with uh, Duncan. He's like quite embarrassed. But uh, again, it's like, it's just a, she just has no filter essentially. And it's great, you know, because it starts out with her spitting out food that she just had. And then he's like, oh, you can't do that. He's like, well, if it's revolting, why would I put it in my mouth? You know? And then the lady there's was like, yeah, I say the same thing to my husband, you know, <laughs> and it's just like this real Rodney Dangerfield drug. Like, yeah, get a load of this guy. Um, yeah. And it's just so funny because, the, you know, then Bell's like, oh, you're talking about his penis. Got it. Okay, cool. That makes sense. And it's just this whole like, yeah, that's, that's what the joke was, but she takes it so literal. Um, and I think that's when Duncan, he's really confused and having a hard time, like, quote unquote, keeping control of her like he thought he might be able to, because this is also where their whole sexual escapade really kicks off. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a funny line in there now, but like th- they had sex three times. She's like, well, you can't go anymore. Like, is this some problem with the male species? You know, like, yes. there's some <laughs> the way she stuff phrases that I mean, question is so funny because it's literally like if a baby learned to talk from a scientist. So it's yeah. like uh-huh. incorrect grammar with like really high vocabulary. Yeah. yeah. And she's like, like, is it a problem of the male species? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he's it's like, physiological yes. Problem. <laughs> it's so and funny. My, my biggest takeaway from that, and I know we'll get to it kind of at the end when we talk about Paris and the brothel is like I walked away from that movie and I was like I I don't know like I might need to talk to my wife I don't I don't I don't know how uh how I'm I'm faring in the uh you know in the love <laughs> department men men are just not as good to be honest uh is what I took away from this so uh I don't know little self reflection I guess that I'm I'm just yeah. I'm a guy and I suck I don't know. We can't all be Mark Ruffalo, you know. It's just a <laughs> lesson we all have to accept at some point. This is true. Um, but yeah, then so we get that great dancing scene, uh, which is awesome as well. So yeah, I don't know. I just I thought Lisbon was a interesting. It was a great first section, I think, for their their trip. What did you guys think about Lisbon? Um, I do want to point out that the first time the movie cuts to color is when she is fucking Mark Ruffalo for the first time. Oh, yeah. oh, I like that. Yeah. Um, nice. So I thought that was cool. I like. I liked this chapter a lot. I liked it. Um, uh, shoot, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> I wanted to call out the title cards themselves. Mm-hmm. They're so sick. They're yeah, very cool. Beautiful. Yeah. I wish that. I wish honestly that the movie could have pushed more into that like surrealist surrealism mm-hmm. art because I was getting like almost Terry Gilliam vibes mm-hmm. um, with this movie, and I honestly wish there was more of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I really like this chapter. I really liked the, um, this movie being in montage. I feel like it moved pretty well whenever it was. And there was montage here of like, um, Bella Baxter getting out and just doing whatever it is she wants to do. Um, so yeah, I had a lot of fun with this one. Yeah. Um, when they danced, that was one of the many la- like Yorgos Lanthimisms that mm-hmm. made this movie special. Another one that comes to mind is when, Bella Baxter decides to repeatedly stab that corpse in the eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and there was like more. And every time there, there, uh, it would happen in the movie. I would be like, "Oh, you, Yorgos, you, you dog, <laughs> you." Like I just yeah. feel. And this whole dance scene feels like that at this point because he loves putting them in his movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the dance scene a lot. I think it's really good energy and a great introduction to that energetic dynamic between. Uh, Ruffalo and and um and Stone and uh, I think even their conversations about like kind of what you mentioned of like oh we can't like you can't just keep going doing this all day like why can't we just do this again mm-hmm. like why don't people do this all the time that immediate like flipping it on its head of what uh what 
Ruffalo thought um, his, sorry, what Duncan thought he was going to be able to do with Bella. And then for her to basically advance at like such a rapid pace that he didn't think that this was going to be something that he was going to have to deal with. Uh, and, and so I think that's interesting in, in the context of their uh, relationship as well. I mean, Ruffalo and that stash, the dude gets it. I, I get it. Like I, I understand why they might just, you know, lock themselves in the room. Yeah. You may have invented the mustache, right? It's hard to say. <laughs> um, th- that scene though, Andy, that you talked about with her like stabbing was oh, I think yeah. just another great example of Defoe, just his delivery of just so matter of fact, you know, she's like <laughs> Bella cut. She's like, remember only the dead ones. So <laughs> yeah. She's like, okay, yep. Only the dead ones. And it's like, Oh, they've had this conversation before. Exactly. <laughs> like, this isn't the first time. <laughs> it's so, so good. Um, <laughs> and like that machine at dinner, you know, and he's like, why do you have that? He's like, Oh, my dad took this stuff out of my body. So I don't have any gastric acid anymore, <laughs> but he's like not mad about it. It doesn't seem like he's just like matter of fact, like, yeah, my dad's a scientist too. So he just, he branded my balls. That's just kind of what happens, you know? It's, his delivery was so good throughout this whole movie. I I loved it. Can I can I ask you guys like a very heady thematic question about this movie when it comes to um, Godwin and what he did with Bella? So, do you think that his actions of saving her and and basic and replacing her brain with her child's brain and giving her this evolutionary look at life? Do you think that was was beneficial for Bella, even though she wanted to die? Like ultimately in the grand scheme of like morality and like the world Mm -hmm. does, does, is this a good thing that he did for Bella? I mean, it kind of feels like, it. I mean, he explains his reasoning in the movie of just like the, the woman that killed herself wouldn't want to be alive again. So there wasn't a point in bringing her back to life, even though I could have. So then I, you know, there's like the decision though to like, not just let the baby grow up and live, but just to take the brain out of the baby and put it in the fully formed woman. Like that's kind of weird, but I got his understanding. It was just like, well, I wasn't going to bring the woman back alive. Cause she obviously was done. She wanted to be done. So let's start yeah. someone fresh. So I don't know. I, in a strange way, I got it. Yeah, I got it too. I think, I think too, the woman like wanted to escape. And mm-hmm. at that point, the only means of escape was death. Um, had Willem Dafoe approached her and asked if she wanted to swap bodies and brains with her, <laughs> with the baby inside her stomach, I can't say she would say yes to that. Um, yeah. but <laughs> I do think in the end it worked out for her <laughs> or the yeah. baby, whoever she is at this point. Yeah. <laughs> From Godwin's perspective, I find this question really interesting because to me, it seems as though we mentioned what his, his father did to him and basically experimented on him. I wonder if this is this was his moral conquest to break that uh, generational trauma that his father kind of inflicted on him of like, oh, I, I, I'm stuck burping these bubbles or I'm stuck like basically not being able to to have an erection and get off without like mm-hmm. eight hours of prep. Uh, and so I wonder if he saw this as his way to to change that idea of what like constructing a person might, might be and might entail and experimenting on somebody and use it for, for something good to give someone that self autonomy that Bella ends up going through because we get that very tender moment with them at the end where he is essentially dying. Uh, and, and so I think from his character's perspective, I, I, I really did like that. Um, do we want to talk about the ship? Move to the next scene. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, in Lisbon, uh, again, like, Duncan realizes he can't really keep control like he thought he could. So he's like, I got a surprise for you. Get in this trunk. <laughs> you know, and she's <laughs> like, all right, cool, I'll do that. Uh, then the next scene, you know, trunk opens up and she gets out and we realize that we are on a cruise ship. And he even says as much. He's like, yeah, it's easier for me to keep track of you if we're stuck at sea. So that's, we're on a cruise, um, which she is not stoked about at all. But we there's some interesting things that happen here where she meets some friends, Martha and Harry at dinner. Um, and they kind of open her eyes up a little bit by talking about philosophy and yeah. whether or not polite society is really worth it or really good. I thought it was a great performance from both of them, specifically Gerard Carmichael. He was, he was really good. So um, it was, it was, I don't know. I really enjoyed the whole ship sequence. I thought it worked really well. This is where she starts reading. Right. And, and yeah. kind of has that philosophical enlightenment of that, 
it opens up that other door of like what what does it mean to be a person, a human mm-hmm. participating in society that might be outside of the physical or like the sexual gratification realm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's good. Sure. What do you think I, of the scene, Annie? Um, this chapter I didn't love as much, mm-hmm. and I think honestly it's just because it was no longer like advancing the plot and it Mm. was more so just like advancing Bella Baxter through, like you said, philosophy and friendship. Yeah. Um, But because it wasn't advancing the plot, I was like not so hot on this. It wasn't as engaging for me. Yeah. Um, I will say the moment that they do a little pit stop in Alexandria and I just the part where she sees she looks down and she sees there's like slaves and like poverty and but in a very like really intense Mad Max almost style yeah. way like people yeah. fighting over water Um, she sees this and she immediately like wants to run off this crazy staircase now this place was very surreal I wanted more of this mm. um and her friend catches her and is like, no, it's okay. And then later he admits that he wanted to hurt her. All of that, I really, really liked. Like her wanting to like throw herself over this building because she just saw something that's so sad. I really, it really touched me. I don't know why. Maybe just because it like pulls us out of the, what it's trying to do of like, we see this all the time and it doesn't affect us like. Yeah. Maybe it should, like it does Bella, because she's like a child to this world. Yeah. That was very touching. But the friends, like I wasn't, it felt like a side quest to me. Yeah. Sure. I think to that effect, I, I agree. It did feel kind of like a, a little bit of a side quest. Is Martha, was that the older woman that she ends up befriending? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really enjoyed her deep deep concern for martha feeling sexual gratification um (laughs) with her herself or her hand or whatever she chooses to use i thought that was really really funny Mm -hmm. just from from like a yorgos lanthimos perspective and like it just works in that world but also from like bella not you know 35 minutes ago did we see her learning how to do that herself and understanding what that means for her and the pleasure that it gives her and, uh, and society's perspective on that. So I think that's a really cool thing that preaches to the movie of like, she just, she just like asked her about it, just like out in the open. They're just in the middle of this, this dining hall in, yeah. in the, in the cruise. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say about the scene is this is where I feel like it really dives into tackling what I feel like the movie as a whole kind of works its way through is this um is maslow's like hierarchy of needs because we meet with bella and she doesn't understand the world and then as we go through it she does come up with these things like belonging and love and then esteem cognitive aesthetic like she works her way through this hierarchy of understanding what the needs of a human being really really are uh and i think that this scene sparks that journey which which i think works uh even if this even if this part of the movie feels a little disjointed for sure yeah and i yeah i think again we kind of learn what is important to her and what her focus is because she even introduces duncan to martha this is, this is my friend martha she hasn't been fucked in 20 years <laughs> and he's like okay great okay. you know um but yeah it's it's good to see her kind of grow throughout the whole movie um we so we have a scene later on where duncan is gambling his money away basically doesn't look like he's doing well at all and this is as the slum scene is happening and then we turn around come back from the slums and we see ruffalo just like passed out on the bed and it turns out he won all this money and then bella just like gathers it all up she's like i'm just gonna go give it to these people um and then these two kind of ship people whatever they're like uh we'll take care of it don't worry you know they kind of like the garage attendants and ferris bueller like yeah we'll take yeah, your car we we'll park it. it don't worry um <laughs> And that just leads to them getting kicked off in Marseille where they eventually end up in Paris and we get, we, you know, begin this whole new sequence. But I think overall, I agree. I think the ship is like, as far as title card sequences go, maybe the lower of them. Um, But I do still think there was some interesting stuff that kind of happened here, Mm -hmm. but then we end up in Paris and she learns that she can have sex for money. And that just leads (laughs) to this whole chapter here, which is like, she says, she says it as much. She's like, I need sex and I need money. So this works out perfectly. Um, Which 
you know, at first leads to Duncan just losing his mind that she would do something like this. Uh, but then obviously leads her to go back to the brothel and work there for a while to save up money. What did you guys think about the sequence? Cause there's so much that happens here. We learn, she learns a lot, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, I think, think the very first customer is like, shouldn't we get me warmed up a little bit? You know, and it's just like, no, that's not how this isn't Duncan anymore. This is something yeah. completely different. Um, but she makes some good friendships with the other women there as well. But yeah, what what do you guys think about the, the parent sequence? What about you, Annie? Um, to me, this felt like another one, another sequence of the boat where it's like, she's going to learn oh. more things mm. and expand and the plot again here to me wasn't that much it wasn't driven that forward mm-hmm. it, just in this chapter and then the previous one um that being said i think i had more fun with this chapter i don't know why i mean when um the leader of the brothel i forget that actress's name but when she says like a woman charting her way to freedom i love it yeah mm-hmm. um I felt that too. I was like, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, And I love like Bella, like becoming like a socialist and Mm. making friends. And then Duncan, like I love seeing the fall of Duncan. And at this point, my mind's like, where is this going? Like, where are we going from here? I like, this didn't feel, I didn't expect to, to come here and I didn't expect to go to the boat. So where are we going to go from here? Um, And I wouldn't have guessed. So, but I like that, honestly. Um, but yeah, that's what I thought. This this brothel scene is my favorite scene in the whole movie. It's my favorite like amalgamation of scenes. Um, I think it's probably because it does remind me the most of like Belle de Jour and 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 the happenings of that film. So I saw the most crossover in this one. I love. I I am just consistently a proponent of like more sex in movies, and of course this is doing that. And I think it's doing it very smartly and well and provocatively and it and it works on like an entire level so for me to see something like this pulled off very successfully especially in a yoros lanthimos film in which like the world is more surreal but the ideas and themes that we're processing and working through of like powering our way to freedom those are very real and like those are very applicable things um, that we can pull from this film i think it it works as a whole really really well for me uh obviously it helps that emma stone is completely like lights out gorgeous uh, i love her long black hair the costuming i think this is the the best kind of stint of costuming that we get uh from all of the other the the patrons of the brothel mm. and everything that we we get to see and uh all of this come to find out she had emergency money that she could have just used uh, in the beginning which mm. i think is really funny to me and and really insightful to the things that matter to Bella and like what she wants to pursue uh, to feel her most authentic self. Obviously we get kind of get the downfall of Ruffalo and him encapsulating like maybe this, this societal white male view of like what that means for a woman and trying to dictate what that means for Bella when he has no right or power to do so. Uh, And I think it's absolutely hysterical and ridiculous that a, f- a father brings his two sons into a brothel to watch him get fucked. <laughs> just give um, a tutorial. <laughs> just crazy stuff, honestly. <laughs> I mean, there are some funny moments in here, like especially that guy comes in and they do the lineup, and then she steps forward. Like, what if the women picked? Like, wouldn't you <laughs> yeah. be stoked if one of us picked you rather than you picking <laughs> us? Like, wouldn't that be more exciting for you? Wouldn't that be kind of cool? Um, and then there's another client later on where she's like, okay, here's what's going to happen. You're going to tell me a childhood story. I'm going to tell you a joke. I'm going to smell you and make sure you smell okay. And then like, let's, let's build some rapport before we get into this. I just like, yeah. I really liked her, like that growth throughout these things where she's like, okay, I'm going to take a little control back here. Um, but it's all done just in a very humorous and very funny way. So, yeah, this is where we see as well. Uh, her name is Catherine Hunter. Annie, I think you were searching for that. Her name is a Swiney in, in mm-hmm. this movie. She plays in the tragedy of Macbeth. She plays like one of the witches, mm-hmm. uh, very, very excellent oh, yeah. actor. She plays all three witches, right? Doesn't she? Isn't she? Uh, yeah, 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 I believe yeah. so. Yeah. So, right. and she's excellent in this movie as well. Are her tattoos, are those real tattoos or was that part of the movie? Part I, because I, I was sold either way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's part of the movie. Damn. But they look <laughs> but legit. They were cool. Yeah. yeah. They, they look, look really cool. good on her. <laughs> that, that was, those were good tattoo. That was good tattoo work. Sometimes yeah. they just look 
fresh and black. And it's like, this is not, this is not a tattoo at all, man. This is, yeah, yeah hers were great. Um, so yeah, now we get to the point where Godwin has fallen ill, um, and calls for her to come back. And it's funny because this also reminds me of all the letters that we see back and forth and how she just kind of just like, just says simple phrases like bit hairy mouthful of blood, you know, it's just like <laughs> things like that. And the way Godwin like, like tells us to her, it's like, Godwin's sick RIP soon or something like that. Yeah. You know, she's like, oh, okay, I guess I, I guess I better go home. Um, so she goes back to London and she's like, oh, you're sick. He's like, no, I'm not sick. I'm dying. You know, mm-hmm. again, that's the doctor side of him. It's just going to be very pragmatic about it um, and very straightforward. And then her reconnecting with Max, which I thought was really, really interesting because it felt like he was like, no, I'm not going to like m- make you hold true to what you said before. You were a lot younger then, like things are totally yeah. different. Um, but then it turned where she proposes to him and she's like, well, I still want to be with you kind of thing. So let's, let's do this. So, um, yeah, obviously that leads to the wedding, which leads us meeting Christopher Abbott and what a scene that is with Ruffalo hiding behind him. (laughs) Um, just so, so crazy. Uh, what did you think about this whole wedding sequence, Annie? Oh man, I loved that wedding sequence and I love this whole chapter. The plot is back, baby. We're back in the We're plot. Back. <laughs> We're so back. Um, but Christopher Abbott, I didn't know he was in this movie when I saw it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, whenever he shows up, God, I love every time he shows up in something. I love mm-hmm. Christopher Abbott. He's so awesome. So, um, when he showed up, I'm like, of course we're going to meet the husband. I didn't think, right. I don't know why I ever thought we weren't going to meet the husband. Like that's mm-hmm. how it felt. Um, and she grows she agrees to go with him um and is trying to like figure out what kind of guy he was and also why she would try to kill herself because by this point she knows she did that and i loved that discovery and like how the stakes were being raised of like the the threat increased like slowly whether it was there the whole time she was like um coming she was like starting to figure out the threat like how mm-hmm. he was like the the help are like organizing an uprising, I think. Mm -hmm. And then she finds out why, and it's because they were terrible people. And that's why she wanted to kill herself. And then all the way to like genital mutilation, which is like crazy, but also very fitting for this movie. And like with the sexual freedom, like themes within it's like a perfect physical Mm -hmm. threat to, for Bella to have to face. So I loved that whole chapter. I, I thought it moved really quickly. I thought it moved quicker than almost all the other chapters. So but fast. Yeah. Yes. But, um, I really liked the pace. It was really awesome. Abbott really fit well within this world. And, uh, I agree. I think he's getting a reputation now where it's like, Oh, cool. Christopher Abbott's in the movie. Like that <laughs> something good is going to go down. Like, you mm-hmm. know, he's going to bring something special. So I had the same reaction when he showed up. I was very surprised a very much uh same mindset of like oh yeah of course we're gonna understand more of her backstory like that why would we have gotten that in the beginning if we're not gonna kind of circle back to this and mm. and really do go full circle with everything I love that he literally shoots himself in the foot with his with his <laughs> gun and uh, I think that is a, a, more of that like dark comedy from Yorgos that really yeah. really works uh and like some of those practical gags it did feel very quick but I thought that was a smart way to wrap the movie and to kind of speed us up through um, what we've spent so much time like focusing on through the rest of the film and not use like the final 20 minutes to like meander or like really deeply think about, okay, what has the last 90 minutes been about or the last two hours been about? Like, I think that was a good way to get back to the plot and to make something really interesting happen. Uh, And then obviously we, we get the ending and at Christopher Habit's character gets turned into a fucking goat, goat? right? Yeah, or like yeah. whatever. And uh, we see Bella like sipping a martini and kind of like running Godwin's house. And Max is still there. And I thought it was a really satisfying and humorous ending to see Bella use what she's learned and 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 constitute that to be like, okay, now I'm like running a house of freedom where like I, I put people in their place and I help the people that need it and deserve it. Mm. And, and we're, we're going to help the next Bella and, the, and these types of things. So I, th- I thought it wrapped really well. And the energy that Chris Rabbit brought was completely different from something we'd seen in the movie, I think. Yeah. Up until that point, which I liked. Yeah, I thought it was a, a nice 
ending, you know, just wrap up with a bow on it. Her friend from the brothel came to live with them. She's, mm-hmm. you know, reading and educating herself even more. Everyone's just kind of living in harmony. And it's a, it's a beautiful backyard to say the very least, man. I'd, <laughs> I'd hang out back there anytime. So I thought it was a great ending. And this, I mean, it's yeah. got a runtime of two twenty, So this is kind of a fast paced ending, but any, any longer, you know, you may have felt the, the runtime on it. But as it was at 220, I, I didn't feel like I had been there that long. I think it, it moves along nicely. Yeah. And it's so funny, too, that it just like kind of keeps you on the hook yeah. the, the, the whole time. Uh, Annie, what is your true cinema moment if you had to pick one thing that's your favorite? Oh, one moment. Um, I'm going to go with when we learn about how Bella was created. Not only just like the lines are hilarious, but the shots, seeing her being made and like the brain, uh, very provocative. I loved it. Yeah. I like that. What about you, Ben? Uh, I mean, it's hard not to love almost everything in Lisbon, uh, but specifically just calling him out for not being able to go for a fourth round because of the <laughs> physiological problem with the male species. Like, it's just, yeah, you know, I mean. You're not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, not wrong. Not wrong at all. Uh, I I think outside of the brothel, which like vastly was like my favorite sequence of things, I do like in Lisbon when she goes out on her own because this male problem uh, and, and Duncan is taking a nap and she goes out on her own and she um, she eats and she explores and kind of that's the first time we see her doing things in a society independently Mm -hmm. and realizing like, Oh, maybe Duncan was right. Like maybe I shouldn't eat another one of those things. Uh, But he's wrong about certain things as well. And so like her discovering that, and that's really where we get the full Yorgo's treatment of what that place looks like, which is very, very cool to watch. Very surreal world, um, which is fun. Uh, Okay. I, 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 like poor things quite a lot. Uh, I don't think it's going to win best picture, but I am very, very excited and happy that it's even in the conversation considering the mature content that it, that it focuses on and the mature themes that it, that it resonates with, I think Mm -hmm. is really important. You guys want to quickly talk about the best cinematography race? Let's do it. Yeah. So of course um, we're just guessing what's going to be nominated. So hopefully we're right. We'll see. Uh, and if not, we'll have a fun little make believe um, this is what things might've been. Um, so poor things we think is going to be nominated for best cinematography. Um, of course, this comes from cinematographer Ro- Robbie Ryan. The other four ones that are currently predicted and on the slate to be nominated are El Conde, uh, Edward Lockman, and that's a Netflix production, Killers of the Flower Moon, R- uh, Rodrigo Prieto, Maestro, Matthew uh, Libatique, and Oppenheimer, Hoyta Van Hoytema. Five very quite prominent cinematography names. So, mm-hmm. Annie, to what you were saying, like at the beginning of the episode, it does feel like this kind of year where things are just stacked. Like, we just have a lot of very, very good options everywhere we go. Next in line, right outside those five, is Saltburn, The Zone of Interest, and Barbie. Those are like slots six, seven, and eight right now um, based on predictions. Annie, I'll start with you. What five do you think are going to be nominated, and what movie do you think will win Best Cinematography? Um, I'm going to say Killers of Flower Moon, Maestro, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, Zone of Interest. Mm. And I think that Oppenheimer, Hoyt Van Hoytema, is going to win this. That's yeah. my prediction as of right now. It's a good yeah. prediction. I'm, I'm going to steal the floor and I'm going to say I, I was literally going to say the exact same thing. Nice. So I got nothing <laughs> to add to that conversation. That's 100% how it's going to go. Yeah, I mean, I was leaving my fist spot open. I haven't seen El Conde and I've, you know, I, who am I to tell Clayton that it's not a good selection, but uh, <laughs> Zone of Interest definitely seems like something that could play in there. Um, Robbie Ryan, though, just very briefly, like he's done some A24 stuff that we've talked about on the pod. Uh, he did come on, come on. He did. Oh, Medu- I did not know that. That's yeah. really intriguing. He did Medusa Deluxe, which is kind of that Warner movie oh, that we watched, which is wow, really okay. kind of interesting. Yeah. And uh, American Honey, along with others like Marriage Story and stuff like that. So, oh, great wow. cinematographer. Yeah, really good cinematographer. Uh, I think the yeah, I think the Zone of Interest will definitely get in this five. I'm really curious to see when when the nominations come out if it's going to be in there um we're not going to be predicting our best picture winners or nominees today because by the time this episode comes out those will already be out in the world so kind of a futile exercise uh, mm-hmm. really 
do we have any any other thoughts on on poor things before we wrap up? Anything that didn't get said or, or that you wanted to mention? I mean, not for me. I I think we covered everything. I think a lot of great performances, as mentioned earlier. I wouldn't be surprised if all three of those acting noms happened. Because I think mm-hmm. Willem Dafoe is great, Ruffalo is great, and obviously Emma Stone did a, a wonderful job. So very curious to see what kind of noms this movie ends up with. Yeah, I have nothing more to say about poor things. I'm just really excited to see what Yorgos does next. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Same here. Very curious to see what happens after poor things. And probably one of his more critically acclaimed films, uh, at least compared to like The Lobster and The Killing of the Sacred Deer. I know, obviously, The Favorite quite critically acclaimed as well. So he's on a pretty good streak right now. So I'd be really curious to see what comes next for him. Uh, Annie, oh, thanks for. Sorry, super quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I, I just gave you looked your it time, up. so no, you you're, did. Done. We're you're, done. you're off. <laughs> Yorgos's next movie says it's completed. What? Called Stop. Kinds of Kindness with Emma Stone, Willem Dafoe, Jesse Plemons, oh. Hunter Schaefer, Margaret Qualley, Hong Chow. Like, oh, what Hong Chow what? supremacy. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, coming back. What are they making this one on the weekends? Like, I yeah, guess. What are I we mean, doing? It, honestly, the plot line literally says plot kept under wraps. So Ooh. I have no idea what it's about, <laughs> okay, but it's with that cast, I'm super stoked. But it, what I is mean, this IMDb called again? says you it's completed. Kinds, kinds of kindness. Of k- kinds of kindness. Oh, that's fascinating. I literally have not heard about this at all. I think that's very interesting. There's been some, and, looks like some press leaked photos and stuff. Uh, so yeah, they've been shooting it, but. An upcoming anthology film directed by Yorgos Lanthimos from a screenplay he co-wrote. That's literally all Google says. Dude, yeah. Hunter Schaefer and Hung Chow, though, I'm so fucking in. Yeah, it's gonna be That's awesome. That's incredible. Uh, Sorry, I just had to put that out there. Yeah, I'm excited. No, I'm that glad. was good. Glad. That was worth it. Approved. Um, that was definitely worth the time. Uh, Annie, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, such a delight to have you. If people want to find more of you, where can they find you at? Yeah, you can find Movie Mavens, my podcast, anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can find me on Instagram at Annie underscore Janes, and you can find Movie Mavens on Twitter. At Movie Mavens. Spicy nice. double feature. Spicy yeah, double feature. Let's yeah. go. Super it. great. Uh great pod. Highly recommend checking out the checking out the show. Next week on this pod, we're going we're going heartfelt. And we're talking about the holdovers. Number five on our best picture slate. I'm pretty excited. I'm interested to see how our conversation goes. Yeah, we'll be halfway through. Um, I got to read Marcus Aurelius before then, but other than that, I'm ready to go. Yeah, good. <laughs> other than that, I'm just honestly, I'm going to turn that into a big fat liar pod. That's the only, <laughs> okay. that's the only right. plan that I have for that that episode. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, yeah, cool. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, you want to you want to close I'm, this out, Ben? Yeah, I'm losing my mind. I was thinking about meditations now. So uh, <laughs> you went into yeah. your own space. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, Giamatti, you know, he just gets on the brain and it's that I know, PR you already d- at work. That's what yeah. it is. You drift away. It's working. Yeah, I'm just like, you know what? I got to vote for him. I don't even have a vote and I got to vote for Giamatti. I'm thinking um, about in and out over here. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> uh, <laughs> let us know what you guys thought about this episode about poor things. What awards do you think it's going to take home from the Oscars? Is it going to win Best Picture? I don't know. That's a, that's a challenge, but it's going to be nominated pretty sure. So let us know what you think. We're on Twitter and Instagram at 24 minutes of 824. And you can also watch us on YouTube. Subscribe to us there. Next week, we talk about the holdovers. You can see if I have a lazy eye that moves from left to right. You know, it's hard to say. That's the only way. <laughs> which one do I out. look at? I'm not sure. Which one? Yeah. <laughs> which one do you look at? So subscribe to us there. Thanks everyone for your support. I am Ben Lawhorn. And I am Ethan Simi. I must go punch that baby. 